have been coming the past couple past couple of games. And like I said, if it's consistent, I can I'll be able to find a bit of a rhythm and find myself. And uh, it's been it's been happening the past couple of games. How valuable is this time right now that you have these opportunities and these minutes to kind of like not just showcase your game, but kind of also contribute towards uh, winning? Uh, you know, it's super super valuable. You know, opportunities. Some that you got to seize when the moments come, uh, and I'm just trying to do my best. Of that obviously would be a lot better if it came in, you know, some wins. But you know, it's part of the NBA. You just got to learn and keep growing with it. What's the added layer of difficulty in playing alongside, you know, not just you know new teammates that are like, new to you, but other guys who are also new and learning the system themselves? Uh, it's definitely a challenge we're all facing together. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time in in, uh, in the gym together, but just part of you know. All of us being young, we're still trying to find that that mesh, um, and I think this is a, a good start, you know, for this team and for the future. And with roles changing down the stretch here, how does your mentality kind of change along with that as well? Uh, you know, when I play, I just try to be myself, um, and like I said, uh, when the opportunity comes and it's consistent, you know, I can, you know, find my rhythm and also be, you know, a consistent player. It's just something that, you know, comes with that time and opportunity. Coach mentioned that he was having um, some sit-down meetings with everybody on the team individually. Uh, was there any goals that you are like focusing on? Uh, yeah, just you know, staying locked in on the defensive end. Um, you know, continuing to to you know get to the rim and finish. You know, using my size is something that with my shooting ability I forget sometimes how, how big I am. Um, but you know, those were two big things, and then other stuff is just stuff we keep in the got to keep in the office. Coach, and referencing something that you said earlier this season, you mentioned that they, there are no moral victories. Um, obviously, tonight was a tough game playing a team twice. But what did you see from an effort standpoint that's kind of stood out to you from your team? Or did you want to see more? Uh, I thought that our effort was, was good throughout the whole game. Uh, start of the game, uh, our communication, a couple of coverages was not to the point. Uh, we had a little bit different designations tonight and we put players in a little bit different uh, defensive coverages that they used to. But as the game was progressing, they were able to pick it up and communication was getting better. Uh, guys did a really good job on the bench communicating with each other and, and, and really focusing on, on getting better and uh, having solution for some of those. Uh, as the game prog progressed, I thought that our coverages, pick and rolls and DHOs, they were really good. Uh, we really got hurt in some uh, first half. They had eight points on buzzer beaters and we kept them to 52 points in the first half. You know, th those kind of possessions, those kind of plays are, you know, momentum changing plays. And then uh, start of the third quarter, they went on, on a run. Uh, we missed some uh, layups and turned the ball over. On the other side, they, they were uh, may able to get out and score in transition. Of course, uh, you know, when you look at the, you know, the box score, especially in the first half, it was a very like equal score in contributions. You guys played to your strength in transition. Um, what did you see from there that, you know, like something that you guys would like to break down in film and, and continue those good habits? Um, I thought that in, in the first half, uh, uh, ball movement uh, could be a little bit better, but what was really good was our uh, cuts and uh, moving without the ball. We were able to, to touch the paint on multiple possessions and score that way. Um, that was a good part uh, there. And in the second half, I thought that Jordan had a pretty good spark over there, uh, scoring and being able to get all the way to the rim and create shots for himself and his teammates. I want to touch on Kelly Olenek for a minute and some of the, you know, intangibles that he's brought to this team since joining the Raptors and, and having that kind of impact. Yes, so what do you want to know? Just, you know, what are some of the intangibles that Kelly Olenek brings to this squad? First of all, he's a player with a lot of experience. He's uh, one of the smartest basketball players uh, in NBA. Just the way he uh, he's able to connect with his teammates. Uh, his uh, his feel for the game is is unbelievable, and uh, I thought, that especially in the first half, that he did a really good job of uh, playmaking and and connecting with his teammates. Uh, obviously, uh, you know Kelly is playing a starter role now and playing heavy minutes, you know, expanded minutes, and that's a little bit of adjustment for him. Plus, new team and and uh, just getting to learn uh, with, with with his teammates. Thanks for boom. Okay, so. This was not fun to watch. A lot of talk after the last game. If we're going to go study the tape, we're going to, you know, make some adjustments. And, you know, you just found a completely different way, but almost the exact same way to lose the exact same basketball game. 
by more. And it wasn't very competitive. And if you were watching this game in the first half and you were, I don't know, encouraged by the fact that it was only a five point gap at halftime, you knew exactly what was coming at third in the third quarter, right? And that's exactly what came. And you watch as much basketball as I have in my life. You understand when teams are floating and when teams are trying and, you know, when you will know that you're better than the other team, you don't need to go balls out. You don't need to do basically what the Boston Celtics did to the Washington Wizards. I was just talking to my boy Goat and I was like, man, if just for one day, just for one day, I could do a show about not the Raptors. Let me do a show about the rest of the league right now because there's some awesome stuff that went on around the NBA today. Briefly. A massive comeback from the San Antonio Spurs. And if you watched it, it was really impressive. I think it was down 20 and then they came back. That was very cool to watch. The duel between the Dallas Mavericks and the Denver Nuggets, also a huge comeback. If you look, uh, I was watching NBA basketball all day. I got to tell you, I watch a lot of NBA basketball. Generally, I usually hone in on the Raptors games. The Raptors games are like the creme de la creme. It doesn't matter who else is playing. I'm a pretty big diehard Raptor fan. And so for me, those Raptor games are like what I look forward to all day. I got to tell you, 6 6 p.m. came. I was like, okay. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see if something happens here. Because I got to tell you, it's not interesting. It's not interesting to watch. It's not. It's not beautiful to watch. There's really no chance in hell. You don't have talent. As the title says, the D plus for talent and A plus for effort. I think A plus is generous. I think it's like a B plus for effort, you know. Um, but man, all right. It's it's just not fun. So I watched a lot of NBA basketball today. And the best game I definitely watched was Denver versus Dallas. It was very interesting. Also featured a huge comeback. Um, I think with six minutes to go in the fourth quarter, I looked at ESPN.com and Dallas was 90 six or 98 percent likely to win the game and then denver storms back and you're just like oh my god are they gonna pull this off is this actually gonna happen and then jamal murray goes nuts and then he makes the shot and he makes another shot and you're like god damn it who is beating the denver nuggets for an nba championship given their clutchness in in these tight in these tight games and then kyrie irving just makes a shot that only Kyrie Irving could ever make, which is a lefty hook shot over (laughs) Nikola Jokic from like 20 feet away. Like it was 18 to 20 feet away. And it's just like, wow, the, the talent on display is, is crazy, man. Uh, Ram saying Ramadan Kyrie. a different (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Karen Hall saying, that's funny. I was just wondering to myself whether it's going to be a chore for you to watch the Raptors. <sighs> okay. So to be completely humble about this, this is my dream. Okay. To be able to watch the Raptors, talk about the Raptors, have a channel devoted to the Raptors is a dream come true. And to have a team that moves the basketball and generally plays for each other and plays hard and is building with youth is a dream. I'm just saying it's not that interesting. I'm not I'm not not thankful for it. It's a weird way of saying I am thankful for it. I am thankful that I <laughs> It's two different types of misery, you know? Last year there was a type of misery where you were watching a team that was capable of 50 wins and you're watching them play like the worst version of themselves on most nights because guys just refuse to buy into team concepts. Then on the other hand, this year, you have the complete flip side, especially when Scotty Barnes goes out, where you're watching a team that really might lose to certain, you know, EuroLeague teams right now. I'm not even kidding about that. This team could lose to a couple of EuroLeague teams. If you watch enough EuroLeague basketball, you know what I mean. Um, and they're just so deprived of talent. But they are doing the right stuff. They're generally playing the right way. They're playing through the right avenues. They're building up good habits. So it's like a little bit of a catch-22. It's just so boring. It's so freaking boring. I hate to say it like this, but when the outcome is clear from the jump, like, do you know how obvious it was that the Orlando Magic were going to win this game? I would have bet my house that the Magic were going to win this game. 
to put this into context, I think at some point the Boston Celtics were beating the Wizards by like 35 points in the first half. It was a bloodbath because the Celtics just decided to try and the Wizards just decided it was Jordan Poole's night to score. And I got to tell you, if you look at the gap in betting odds between Magic and Raptors versus Wizards and Celtics, Vegas gave the Wizards a better shot of beating the Celtics than they gave the Raptors of beating the Magic. Does that put into context just how bad this team is right now and how obvious these outcomes are? It doesn't matter how hard you try. Zigsaw Puzzle saying, Rob, would this team win the NCAA? Yeah, no shit. Of course they would. That's a completely obvious. Uh, Kelly Olenek would be National Player of the Year. Okay, um, you you seen Murray Boyle's draft footage yet? He's OG 2.0. Um, no, I haven't. No, I haven't. But uh, I will make a note of that to go check that out for sure. Um, Titan saying, do you see a big jump in offense for Scotty Barnes next year? Uh, yeah, I, I hope so. And yes, I, I do think I think he'll take a substantial jump. Um, this is a call-in show. Definitely call in if you got something to say. Let's look at the box score real quick. Um, my reflections on this game are simply that the outcome was obvious. And there really isn't much you can do. Uh, the Magic commentators, if you watch the Magic feed because you're sick and tired of... I mean, the, the highlight of tonight's game was that Kelly Olenek up and under sort of shifty, you know, thing. And then Alvin Williams saying it reminds a little bit like Hakeem Olajuwon. <laughs> and I was like, I think Kelly Galenic can officially cross it off his bucket list to finally be compared to possibly the greatest post player of all time. Um, I get where he was coming from. It's just the hyperbole stretch is incredible. Um, Zigsaw saying Alvin killed me with that. I think he killed crop circles with that. Um, it was hilarious. <laughs> Akeem Olajuwon, bro. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, the last time I heard someone compare it to Akeem, it was Yao Ming, actually. So, um, you know. Anyway. Um, <laughs> and Tetra uh, saying, uh, Anthony Black and Grady Dick did a jersey swap for Black. Did it really happen? Yes, it did. And um, I wonder who came up with that. He called that move a dream shake. Yeah. And you know what the depressing part about that is? Alvin played with Hakeem. He was on his team. He watched him do the dream shake in practice. Alvin is sometimes a little bit clueless when it comes to uh, basketball analysis, but he's gotten a lot less. He's like, I think he started out like two years ago. I found him insufferable. I no longer find him insufferable. I find him mildly mutable that's progress maybe by next year he'll be mildly entertaining and then by year five he'll be 10 percent of you know uh 10 percent as interesting to listen to as chuck swirsky okay um yeah in terms of you know what the raptors got tonight it was a pretty balanced attack they got a a healthy contribution from jordan wara off the bench uh seven for nine he finishes plus 10 in a game where the raptors lose by 15 that's substantial. Um, I think it's also worth noting that the Magic were missing a very key contributor off the bench in Jonathan Isaac and played, you know, not not their, you know, greatest players ever off the bench. Um, Caleb Houston, who's a second round pick, G League guy, he got 15 minutes tonight. They got some development rep minutes for Jet Howard and Anthony Black got into the game, uh, made his only shot. I'm a very big fan of Anthony Black. And I think he's going to be really good at some point in the future, but you know, you got you got a Showfield, uh, you know, Kiki. You know, you got you got those guys off the bench a little bit too in garbage time. Jalen Suggs doing his relentless, you know, pesky stuff. Um, Wendell Carter efficient as always, but tonight it was really about how do you compete when the other team has the two best players on the court, and it's not really that close. And um, I'm sorry, I'm having some internet issues. I'm I'm seeing the bar go down, so I hope it doesn't continue. But um, I'm not moving around too much. So hopefully if I'm a little bit laggy, the audio is still coming through. Um, Paolo was really impressive tonight. I've talked a lot of shit about Paolo Bancaro, um, you know, being a little bit overrated. I think Chet probably should have gone over him. I, at the draft, preferred Jabari Smith over him. And I look quite foolish for that, given that, 
you know, Paolo is an all-star and Jabari is kind of a question mark still. But long term, I had a lot of questions about Paolo defensively. Um, I think I underestimated his isolation scoring a little bit and just the fact that he's a big dude. But you know what's interesting? Um, watching the Dallas and Denver game. Now, I'm not saying that Jokic was necessarily to blame for Kyrie's shot, right? But it is interesting that Jamal Murray hit his pull-up three to put the Nuggets over against Doncic going under and not covering. And then I and then Kyrie basically ISOs on Jokic to to get that shot off. And it's just like, oh man, it's getting harder and harder to cover for a defensive liability, right? Um, so especially when that defensive liability is your best player. Like there's just so much skill across the league right now. There's no more PJ Tuckers and Matisse Thibault playing heavy minutes so that you can just, you know, camp your star player out on that guy in the corner and just pray they're not going to kill you. Um, no, man, like there are a lot of teams out there like the OKC Thunder that can li literally spread you out five, five ways. And if you have a liability on the floor, they will find it and they will kill it over and over. And increasingly, as big men become more skilled and can step out further and further and guards become bigger, you're seeing, you know, teams like the Thunder and the Magic that have this capability to really pummel your weakest link. And I think tonight, you know, the weakest link got exposed a lot. Um, okay, let's talk about the Raptors. <sighs> Where do we start? Uh, Gary Trent Jr., you know, reasonably positive game. I think, uh, you know, good steal. He finished a layup in transition with contact and got the and one. I think, like, Honestly, if you had given me 50 to 1 odds that he was going to miss that layup, I would have taken it. Or like he would have turned it over or some crazy shit. The fact that he made the and one was pretty cool. Um, Ochai Abaji had one of his better games in, you know, I think just activity level. He drew the matchup of Paolo. He stated to be starting at guard, but really he played more like a power forward in this lineup. Um, he is playing power forward. He's a six foot four power forward right now. Because, you know, Grady's not really strong enough at this point. Gary's not big enough. Emmanuel Quickly is obviously the point guard in this lineup. And Kelly Lennox playing undersized at center. Do you see how small this team is right now? Seriously, do you see how small this team is? You're studying a guy who's 6'1", 2", 6'2", 6'4", 6'5", 6'8", like, and 6'11", in Kelly Lennox, but with small arms. There's not a single guy. I mean, you've gone from having four guys in your starting lineup, five guys at times in your starting lineup, put seven foot plus wingspans. This might be the one lineup the Raptors have played in close to three years that does not feature a single guy that has a seven foot plus, seven foot plus wingspan. Are you feeling it? Because, you know, all those guys you shipped out, they all had plus wingspans. Pascal, 7'3", Precious, 7'3", Scotty is injured right now, 7'4", right? Uh, Jakob, 7'4", 7'3", around there. So it's like, that's a lot of size to make up for. It's a lot, right? Chris Boucher is out. That's another guy with massive, massive wingspan. All your wingspan guys are out. These are, these. this is a, and Again, in terms of closing up the paint, and and now on the other side, you have a team that exploits it so badly because they have. And you're starting a six foot four power forward; they're starting a six foot ten shooting guard. Like, how are you supposed to compete when the size and talent gap is so big? That's why this Orlando matchup did not entertain me at all. I think you had a better chance of beating a team like Houston or. You probably like with the current roster and the way it's constructed, you could probably have a better chance of beating a team like Boston than you do beating a team like Orlando, especially if Chris Apps is not playing. It just, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Emmanuel quickly. Some people are saying he had a really tough game. There's, I think a deeper conversation to be had about Emmanuel quickly and his struggles so far, but we'll talk about that. Uh, Grady Dick, he was fine. Um, you know, he hit two threes. Um, zero rebounds he gets his hands on so many and he's right there he just doesn't grab it i wonder if that's a strength thing right now i think it might be 
I think he needs to get a lot stronger in the offseason. And that, that will that would naturally come. He's 20 years old. He will get stronger. But when he can consistently start to pull down five to six rebounds, you'll have a better chance. Um, the Raptors to win this game would have basically needed to play perfect basketball, like pretty much perfecto basketball. And they didn't play perfect basketball. They had turnovers. I think they had 18 turnovers tonight. That's rough. You know, Manny Quickly had four of them. Kelly Olenek had three of them. Those are two primary decision makers. Grady Dick, maybe your tertiary decision maker in that starting lineup. He had three turnovers. Those turnovers lead to a lot of live ball stuff. And then, you know, you're going to transition. I mean, in fairness, the Magic also turned the ball over 15 times, I believe, tonight. And, you know, the Raptors did get out on the break and convert some of those. But, yeah, you really can't. You can't be going even, even with these guys because their shot making talent is just going to overwhelm you. And tonight, that's really what it is, right? It's not like they shot lights out from three. You know, they make three more threes than the Raptors. That makes a difference, right? Because they do take more threes. So it's not like they substantially killed you from three. They didn't shoot great from three. Both teams shot well below league average from three. The Raptors just shot substantially worse, 26% versus 31%. The gap really is in, the, is in that midi pull-up range, you know, where Paolo killed you and Franz killed you and, and getting to the rim and, and finishing at the paint, you know. That finishing talent, that maybe a guy like R.J. Barrett tilts the balance in a game like this. You know what I mean? Like, like having him go 8 for 14 instead of having, I don't know, Having him go eight for 14 instead of having Emmanuel quickly go four for 15, you know, might make this competitive. And then the now we can get to the Emmanuel quickly part of this equation, which is how good are you when he's the guy they're trying to stop? Because he's not that hard to stop. And that's kind of the point, you know, watched a lot of the Knicks lately, been watching a lot of Knicks games. And just personally been fascinated. I mean, they had a game against uh, the Portland Trailblazers just the other day, which I was like very curious about to see Delano Banton and OG and an OB and, you know, just a lot of ex Raptors, but also to watch Jalen Brunson, you know, operate with a uh, without Mitchell Robinson, without Julius Randle and just see like, how does he, how does he get his game off? And, you know, the thing is, you know, he's so strong. He's so skilled. He's so precise and he's so smart that he's making up for so many things and you know the comparisons between Emmanuel quickly and guys like Jalen Brunson Terry Rozier Kemba Walker it's there um you can argue those guys have advantages that IQ doesn't have IQ has advantages they don't have I think the conversation you know from IQ to Tyrese Maxey or you know Darius Garland maybe that's a level up you know in terms of just raw talent but in terms of you know perfecting the perfectibles when I, when I talk about, you know, Emmanuel quickly, it really does come down to perfecting the things that you can actually control and what you can control really in this, in this scenario would be your compete level, your basketball IQ, your decision-making, your craft, right? There was a particular sequence of plays tonight where, um, IQ gives up probably on a miscommunication, but it might've just been like a lapse in judgment gives up a clear driving lane to Joan to Joan Suggs. Suggs goes down. Then somehow off the make, the Raptors have an advantage in transition. I believe Emmanuel quickly comes down and he has Ochai Abaji. If this is the same play that I'm thinking about, it's either Ochai Abaji. There was like a mistake, mistake very quickly between, between the two. And I don't want to, maybe I'm mistaking it, but there was definitely these two plays. I don't know if they have it in succession, but Basically, Manny quickly gives a clear blow by to Jalen Suggs, and Jalen Suggs gets right to the rim, and obviously there's there's no shot blocking for the Raptors right now. There's none. When Ochai Abaji is your power forward and Kelly Olenek is your center, you have no chance of blocking any shots. You also, by the way, got rid of Otto Porter, who is now retired, since retired. You've gotten rid of Thaddeus Young. Do you know how many guys are just named that had seven-foot wingspans that could actually guard the paint? You have no rim defense. Do you know what I mean? Like, even... John Tay Porter, as much as I would commend his incredible, you know, stat stuffing abilities to get his hands in the way, he's not a traditional rim protector. Rim protectors like have very positive wingspans and standing reaches and, and incredible impeccable timing and athleticism and burst and whatever. So we're talking about Hassan Whiteside types, right? 
guys who can clean up something inside stuff and sort of, you know, clog the paint a little bit. You don't have that right now. So we're back to the Ken Birch, Aaron Baines era right now. And that's really how you lose basketball games because you can't contain at the point of attack, especially when you have lapses in judgment or, you know, lapses in effort the way, you know, letting a guy like Jalen Suggs just get downhill. I just thought it was so easy. You know, the like once you got past your initial guy, the second defender can come over and, and compete and be very disruptive and try to get his hands in there. But at the end of the day, there's nothing at the rim that is stopping a guy like Jalen Suggs or Paolo Bancaro or anyone really on the magic from getting a layup. And that, that includes, you know, Markel Fultz. Uh, and, you know, again, you're just you're so starved for talent. Right. And then on the other hand, there was a. I feel like a better playmaker would have seen this, but Emmanuel quickly did not. Where Ochai Abaji had a clear path to an alley oop, and he's a hell of an athlete, and he's a live wire athlete, and he reads the game well enough that it was a pass that you should have thrown. It's a pass that Scotty would have thrown. It might even be a pass that Dennis Schroeder or Fred Van Vliet would have thrown, although I doubt it because I was pretty angry at those guys for not making that pass pretty much all last season and this season. But a great playmaker would have made that pass. Luka would have made that pass. Jokic would have made that pass. Scotty would have made that pass. You know, Steve Nash would have made that pass. Literally any great playmaker you think of would have made that pass. But Emmanuel quickly took the shot and he bricks the shot. And then, you know, long shot, long rebound and boom, you're already out of position and now you're scrambling. And now it's, I think they got two points in their way. And it's just like swing, 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 you know, three possessions like that. And this is where I say, you know, at some point, he's going to have to get a lot better. There's a lot of things he has to get better at. Number one is attention to detail. Number two is his shot release. I feel like his shot release is tad slow. Um, there just doesn't seem to be a lot of space for him to operate when he has to be the driver initiator of your offense. Like his handle is, is good. It's not great. It's not this. It's not going to shift the defense the way, you know, a Tim Hardaway crossover was was doing it back in the day, right? So the handle is is good, but not great. The the shot is good, very good. You know, he's a good shooter, but it's a tad slow. The finishing talent has gotten a lot better and dynamic. And I think he's got some upside, like the combination of two things. One will be improvement on his end. Number two will be the roster around him and the play finishing and playmaking talent and just generally his playmaking ability, unlocking the play finishing around him next year. I think these two things alone could make him a very, very improved player next year. Manual quickly is what I'm talking about here. But right now, if you're going to hone in on him as your like Trey Young wannabe or Steph Curry wannabe or Jalen Brunson wannabe, you know, any one of these small guards or... Damian Lillard want to be well those guys have distinct advantages over him number one they're all better passers than him all of them they're like seriously so when a team decides to blitz the coverage on the pick and roll they're going to find advantages that man quickly simply does not see right now and may never see in fairness that may never happen that may never happen for him it doesn't happen for a lot of guys so when you talk about guys who have like that superstar potential at the point point guard position as undersized guards they usually have that playmaking aspect of it too otherwise they settle into roles more like of the terry rosier um terry rosier colin sexton you know microwave scorer types lou williams jamal crawford etc so playmaking talent you know edges you out into a different category of player you know if if uh if ever Lou Williams had like, you know, if he could combine his shot talent with playmaking talent. And I feel like he was a bit of underrated playmaker because of how many shots he took in the role he had. But if he had that, you know, next level Ricky Rubio type passing, well, then, you know, we're talking about a completely different type of player. And so that I think is, is a bit of a gap, right? The second thing that's a bit of a gap is how dynamic are you in terms of when the team decides to take away the thing that you want to go to, right? When when defenses hone in on you, this is a conversation we had, you know, in the last live, for those of you who might have missed it, because, you know, it's shit's not timestamped right now. I'm being very lazy about that. If you are curious to check out the previous live, Brian Bacon, Scotty's trainer, called in 
and it was around the one hour mark of the last live. And we had this discussion about, you know, defenses honing in on Scotty. And I thought that was very interesting, you know, to think about it because when you're taking on this much of a load and you're like prime and principal number one person on the scouting report, which is what it main quickly is right now for the Raptors, the opposing team is just studying all of your tendencies, all of your plays, how often you go left, how often you go right, how effective you are from the, you know, pull up. You can't be Gary Trent. You just can't. And every time, you know, a guy in the secondary tertiary role goes off for 30 plus points and everyone starts saying that guy should be the guy. It's like you got to understand when you become the guy, just like when Scotty became the guy, just like when DeMar became the guy, there's an adjustment period to, oh, shoot, I used to be able to deal with things by going to my counter. Now I need a counter to my counter to my counter because now teams have figured me out. And that's the problem. Emmanuel quickly doesn't have a counter to the counter to the counter. It's just not sharp enough right now. So he can get into the paint, but the pull up is not great. And then he can get one step further, but the floater is like he's still small relative to some of the some of the players he's having to launch those over. And there's not a great deal of spacing around him because the shot making talent around him is not elite. And so it's not unlocking like the widest angles for him to actually attack. However, it's worth noting that when you know guys like RJ or Scotty were playing. We were seeing Emmanuel quickly get better. So there is some hope for next year that with increased talent around him, that he'll be better. Then you got to think about, you know, what about when you get hit? Like you take a guy like Jalen Brunson and when he gets hit, you go back because he's so strong. And that's something that Fred Van Vliet mastered as well. Even though Fred Van Vliet was no one's definition of, you know, an above the rim athlete or a great finisher, he had this strength that allowed him to take a little bit of contact, especially when he was getting bumped off of a screen or if he was getting a little bit of contact, like he could just, he kind of had that like physical, he was making up for something that he was lacking physically. Uh, Niagara Canada film saying IQ is very replaceable. Um, I wouldn't say he's very replaceable. Um, because when you say very replaceable, I think Jordan Wara and possibly to a lesser extent, Gary Trent Jr. No, I don't think he's very replaceable. I just think he's massively over leveraged as a first option because that's not what he is. And I'm very happy that, you know, um, he's having a stretch like this because not only will it help, you know, him get better in, in the offseason and see his weaknesses and see his gaps, but I also think that it will hopefully suppress some of the contract value that he was, you know, because this guy was on like a crazy heater where he was like 20, 10, and 6 for like a few straight games. And a couple games against the Magic were very sobering to his stat line. Um, that being said, okay, so what do you go to when when get things get tight? So if I'm an opposing team, especially a team that is way more talented and way bigger, I'm going to push for him to get rid of the ball. Now, if I do this in an uncontrolled way, a really gifted playmaker might be able to kill me with playmaking. But because he's undersized and he's a little bit limited as a playmaker, to people who consistently say he's not a point guard, he's not a point guard, you have a point. He's not. He's more typically a shooting guard who's learning the point guard position in a more typical way. Therein lies the problem with how much you can actually punish defenses for being a little bit out of position when they send that double. The second part of that is are you talented enough skill wise to split the double and then finish anyway? Like, can you, is your shot making talent so great that I could send a double to you? You could still make the shot because now I have to think about this. I have to think about the double because how much are you going to punish me if I send, you know, a scramble at you and blitz you on the pick and roll? Are you able to thread the needle, find the guy constantly? But could you potentially have such a quick trigger on your three? that you're going to punish me anyway, even though I blitz the double team and then you're able to just launch anyway. How deep is your range? How much can you spread the guy out? How effective are you from 27, 28 feet? All of these things are going to be piecemeal together for Emmanuel quickly. So he's going to have to get his range a little bit deeper. That will help. So right now you're seeing him take a lot of above the break threes, which is, you know, stated focus for the Raptors. But tonight he goes over six. I think there's enough of a sample in his shooting to say that when there's a little bit more talent around him, he can be pretty deadly from above the break. 
It's just when it's self-created, as opposed to catch and shoot, you run into a different set of circumstances, different set of problems. Um, so it's just, the range has got to be extended, number one. The, the release has got to be sped up a little bit. So that's number two. The third thing is he's got to get stronger. He just has to get stronger. So unlike Fred Van Vliet, he has more burst, in my opinion, and more length and more potential athletically than Fred Van Vliet ever did. He also has more burst length and, you know, athletic potential than a guy like Trey Young, even though Trey is a little bit faster and quicker, et cetera. So when you look at a guy like Emmanuel quickly, it's just a little bit of an incomplete player at this point, right? Um, like it's just a little incomplete. So he's just got to get better at everything across the board. And I see no reason why he won't. So tonight you get exposed. This is, you know, a team that was going to do that to you. They, they were going to expose a lot of your issues because they're basically they're massively overloaded at the place that you're massively lacking, which is length and size. And it's just it's just that simple. And, you know, that being said, losing my 15 points in the road to one of the four best teams in, in the league over the last 10 games is not that bad. Um, to, to, to quickly look at the, you know, game cast slash, this is actually I'm very curious to see if at any point the Raptors were even remotely close in this game. I don't think they were, but let's just see. Was there a point? No. The closest it ever got was right there. 45, 43, when the Raptors took a lead, they, the magic were still 64% likely to win the game. And this game was effectively over at 11.20 in the fourth quarter. So if you fell asleep, like I did, in the fourth quarter, I don't blame you. Because this game was, like, you know, think of this like a little, you know, those uh, that lifeline in the hospital. Do, 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 beep. Yep, that's that's what it is. That that That's a flat line. That's death right there. Like this game was, and I mean, like, honestly, I know it's hyperbole, but like, and, and anything can happen in the NBA and wild upsets do happen. But like right here, like at when it was 11-4, I'm like, this game is over. Like, that's just how it feels right now. And I, and I know that one of these days I'm going to be wrong, but I don't think I am. Like, it's just, you're, you just, you just know, unless the other team decides not to show up, you, you're you not winning unless you play like the craziest, most perfect, hottest shooting game of all time. Um, nothing really sticks out here. Uh, the Raptors win the points off turnovers battle, which was great given that they had more turnovers. They defended better in transition than the magic did. And yeah, um, points in the paint, the magic gets 60 color me surprised 60 points in the paint, which is becoming a bit of a common occurrence, you know, with the Raptors. Um, and again, you know, you hold water pretty much you're dead, even on the free throws, even though they got to the line five more times, right? You're dead even on the three. Well, I don't want to say dead even on the three-point shooting, but you're relatively close enough on the three-point shooting to make up for it elsewhere. You beat them on the offensive glass. So, you know, you're close on rebounds, much closer on rebounds than you should be given the size disparity. You beat them on the assists. You tie them on the steals. You're virtually dead even on the stocks department. You're close enough on the total points and points off turnovers ratio for me that it's just it really just came down to one category, which was right here right here this line right here field goals made versus field goals attempts that's really what it came down to this entire game came down to shot making and ultimately that's that's what it came to be um i haven't talked about this at any point but is anyone curious um about how good jonte porter has been um okay so another stat line where he manages to get a block and a steal in the same game which is pretty cool and it's becoming a bit of a trend over the last four games with jonte porter uh, four points, seven rebounds, three assists, one steal, one block. That's my type of player, man. That's my type of player. He's doing, he, you know, he took the two threes in his twenty four in his twenty five minutes. I uh, sorry, twenty two minutes. A little bit concerned. Uh, okay, I, I, I got to say, Jamie Ramsey was was pretty impressive tonight as well. I thought he guarded his tail off. And on, honestly, even though he's six foot two, six foot three, when he's out there, he feels like the biggest raptor. Is anyone else getting that vibe? Like he, he is just playing so much bigger than his size. And, you know, I think a couple of games ago, he had like six or seven rebounds tonight. He had one, but he just, he feels physically imposing and he seems to care. 
and he's playing really hard. And I don't know if he's going to get extended or whatever, or if the rest of the season is going to be the Javon Freeman Liberty experiment, which I would vastly prefer, to be honest, because I, I do prefer Javon over um, Jamius. But I think both these guys are interesting guys. Um, Andrew's saying he, he moves kind of like OG. Actually, that's a that's a really interesting and fair observation. He kind of does, doesn't he? Um, yeah. So, I mean, look, Jordan Nwara, you know, Bruce Brown, Jalen McDaniels, Ochai Abaji, Gary Trent Jr. To me, these are, I just listed out one, two, three, five guys. Five guys that I don't think should be starting in the NBA. Okay. Five guys that I don't think are like scrubs, but I don't think like, I don't think they should be starting in the NBA. I don't think they should be. I don't think like you should be like, man, we need that guy to have a good game to have a chance. I don't think those are the guys, right? They're all big question marks and they make a lot of money, you know, especially when you're talking about Bruce Brown and Gary Trent Jr. That's like over $40 million tied up in two very big question marks. Then Ochai Abaji, you know, I just feel like right now, you know, if I could slot all those guys into an ideal role, it's probably seventh to 10th guy off the bench, 11th guy. If, you know, if right now Jordan Wara goes to the OKC Thunder and he's like the 10th guy off the bench, I don't think you're in trouble at all. You know, um, if he's in Orlando and he's like the ninth or 10th guy, I don't think you're, I don't, I don't think if he replaces Joe Ingles that you're necessarily better, but I don't think you're in trouble. Do you know what I mean? But if he's like the guy that you need to spark your bench on a night to night basis and you can't bench him in case he doesn't have it. And weirdly enough, I would put Chris Boucher in this role as well. I would put Chris Boucher in that category as well. Probably put Kelly Olenek in that category as well. Uh, for the time being, probably put Grady Dick in that category as well. You just have a team full of seventh to 10 guys. That's really what it is. And that's when I say you lack talent because your talent, like the only player that played for the Raptors tonight that would definitively be one of the top seven guys in an NBA rotation for a good team is probably Emmanuel Quickly. Right? I mean, he was sixth man in New York. I feel like he would probably, you know, he would be like sixth to seventh, fifth. He'd be fourth to seventh in most rotations. He's number one for you. The guy who's number two for you tonight would probably be seventh or eighth in most rotations. Thank you, Rob. Say it again, man. I mean, I don't know how much I want to beat that dead horse. So really, when you're talking about RJ Barrett, RJ is in a similar boat of like flaws and all, you know, what, whatever you find wrong with his game, he's still a top seven guy in an NBA rotation, right? If RJ Barrett's your sixth man, you're good, good shape. If he's your fourth starter, he's good shape. But when he's playing for the Raptors, he's like their first option when Scotty's out. Now you're over leveraged. So everyone's over leveraged. And then compound that, you're being over leveraged as a playmaker and a decision maker in this offense because the offense demands so many reactions from the players. So you're being forced into an uncomfortable situation. And then on top of that, you're also not really covering for guys defensively and you're asking guys to really guard straight up a lot without a rim protector. And so guys are being over leveraged there. This is what I call an ethical tank, right? You're not throwing games. You're not deliberately, you know, playing shitty brand of basketball. You're playing a arbitrarily constructed, difficult brand of basketball. You're playing a harder game than you could be. To describe what the Raptors feel like right now, I'll tell you what they feel like right now. And this is actually the perfect metaphor, and I'm really happy that I just thought about this. Have you ever played basketball in ankle weights? Like substantial ankle weights, like 15-pound ankle weights? Or you ever play basketball with a heavy ball? That's what it feels like the Raptors are doing right now. It feels like they are playing with ankle weights and a heavy ball. Is this going to make you more effective right now? No, it's not going to make you more effective right now. Is it going to boost your ability to guard or no, because you have ankle weights on. It's going to make it harder for you to guard. And, you know, um, is it going to make it easier to win games? Shit, no, 
course not. You have ankle weights and a fucking heavy ball. It's not going to be easier to win games. But at some point, you're going to put those ankle weights off and you're going to put that heavy ball down and you're going to replace it with a regular ball and not ankle weights and you're going to be faster, better, quicker and way better for it. This is the ugliest part of development, but it is so crucial. Now, look, I am a very big critic of teams developing improperly. Very big critic. I hate the way the Detroit Pistons have done it. I don't like the brand of basketball the Houston Rockets played last year. That was just terrible. Brian described it as, <laughs> what do you describe it as? 48 minutes of fuck up basketball. Like basically just go up and fuck up as much as you can. This is not structured chaos. Um, it's just not the right way to develop. This is the right way to develop. Keegan Murray being asked to, to guard up a position before he's ready to is the right way to develop. And, and you see the fruits of that this year, right? Um, having a guy like Scotty shoulder a larger load of the offense than he was ready for this year is the right way to develop. Because again, you're putting ankle weights on the guy and <sighs> Christopher Chu saying Yak has been injury prone. I disagree. I don't think he's been injury prone at all. Um, like he's a seven foot tall human being. I don't think he's any more or less injury prone than any other seven foot tall human being. They're sub uh, substantially more injury prone than the average six foot player. The taller you are, the more likely you are to suffer injuries. There are obviously exceptions to this, and I. Fingers crossed, touch wood. I think Victor Wembanyama will be one of those exceptions. But yes. Um, anyways, so the ankle weight analogy is to say that. I mean, I just frame it back to something I used to do. I used to play with ankle weights. I used to play defense with ankle weights. You know what used to happen when you take those ankle weights off? You felt like you were flying. It makes you stronger, right? I used to wear ankle weights around school. I used to, um, I don't know, like we had this, um, it was like a, it's like a vest that you wear. That's like 30 pounds, 35 pounds. And it's just, you're carrying all this extra weight around you all the time. I don't know about, you know, how effective it is or whatever, but even like ball handling. So I used to have this terrible handle, uh, when I was in grade eight, grade nine, where I would consistently lose the basketball when I would shift left, right. And so the goal was, you know, I learned this from Steve Nash from observing him dribble a tennis ball, dribble the tennis ball. And if you can manage a tennis ball, and if you can really learn to manipulate the tennis ball because of the increased, decreased surface of a tennis ball, it's almost like if you can learn to shoot a slightly larger basketball, you become better at shooting a smaller basketball. There's all sorts of there's all sorts of things, you know, that you can do to train yourself, but ultimately this is how training works, right? You train heavier to lift lighter, right? Um and I think that this is what this season feels like to me. You know, you're having guys and you know, you you look at even some of the guys who've left like OG and Anobi being given like a lot of creation uh, responsibilities in the pick and roll or Precious Achua being asked to be more of a decision maker in the offense. And again, you, you might not see the results of it right away, but at some point down the line, someone is going to reap the benefits of you making that person 5% sharper as a decision maker. So I am very impressed with the Raptors development staff and, you know, overall coaching system. I think it has been very promising. I know it's not leading to a hell of a lot of wins right now. I do want to say silver lining. The Raptors are tied. Hold on. Let me just double check this. Let me pull this up real quick. And then we'll get to our one and only caller, um, which is Little John. Nobody calls anymore. <laughs> People are done with this team. It's just Little John. Coach Mo has given up. Vince is gone. I feel like these guys are just not even watching, watching basketball anymore. I don't know if they're, you know, watching this uh later, but like, yes, I am um kind of disappointed that people are just totally tuned out of this but I, I totally understand it um hold on where are we where are we where are we, where are we at um tank is on okay so the raptors are now tied yeah with the memphis grizzlies so <clears throat> and they've lost seven in a row holy shit
man, to think the Raptors were nine and 11 at some point. Just think about how bad they've been since that point. Holy crap. Wow. I, I got to see this. Okay. So here's the Raptors in a nutshell. At one point, they were 9 and 10, which is one game under 500. Then they got two games under 500, three games under 500, four games under 500, five games under 500. The losses occurred against Phoenix, New York, Miami at home, then Charlotte. Easy to argue that this terrible loss right here might have been the straw that broke the camel's back. But sure, you move to 9 and 14 here. Then you get to 10 and 14 and then a loss and then a win and then three more losses. And I feel at 11 and 18, you know, the writing was on the wall. OG was about to be traded and it was all over. But I feel like this substantial stretch between Cleveland, Brooklyn, New York, Miami, Charlotte, New York, Atlanta, like these losses were it. Now, think about this. Just think about the numbers on this. You went from 9 and 10 in a win against you know, um, the Phoenix Suns, in which Achua had 10, 10 rebounds, Barnes had 23 points, Schroeder had 12, 12 assists. You went from that game to this freaking nightmare. And I believe this is the game that they that they choked down the stretch where uh, on December 6th, and I think like Dennis Schroeder took all those stupid ass shots. And, <sighs> and then look at the bloodbath of Els. Like, do you see this? You went from 15 and 22, which is, you know, let's 15 and 21, where we can say in Golden State, that beautiful, you know, Scotty Barnes defensive outing against Steph Curry, where I think Steph Curry, I know Steph Curry had the worst game of his life. From that game, look at the freaking losses. And then you have this arbitrary three game win streak here against Brooklyn, Atlanta, Indiana, which effectively is the reason you are where you are in terms of tank. But man, Charlotte, Houston, Brooklyn, Atlanta, Indiana. When's the last time the Toronto Raptors beat a team that was comfortably above 500? Golden State's a play-in team. Memphis is a lottery team. The last time was probably Cleveland. And they were playing horrible basketball. So, I mean, they started playing great basketball literally right after that. You haven't beat a good team in a really long time. Indiana might be the closest thing to a good team you've beaten in months. Months. Miami's a play-in team. Chicago's a play-in team right now. Right? Houston is a lottery team. Charlotte is a lottery team. Brooklyn is a lottery team. Atlanta is a play-in team. Indiana is a borderline play-in team. Charlotte's one of the worst teams in the league, if not the worst team in the league. Golden State is a lottery team. Well, it's not a lottery team. It's a play-in team right now. Memphis, lottery. Cleveland is a good team. That's the only team I can say all year that you beat other than maybe on opening night. Phoenix. Is Phoenix a good team? I think Phoenix is a pretty middle-of-the-pack team right now. You beat Detroit, Washington, San Antonio. Dallas is a reasonably decent team. Milwaukee is a good team. Minnesota is a good team. So basically, all of your wins against teams that would be even remotely considered contenders are in the first six games of the season. Hallelujah. This is the season that we have right now. And yeah, it's not encouraging. Um, I think you could say it is encouraging that you've put up a good fight against some good teams. Like you have Sacramento here where you were like within five points or Boston here where you lost by two, right? You lost by two to Boston and you lost by five to Sacramento, right? But you got blown out by a lottery team in Utah, but you got close to the Clippers. You were close. You lost by one to the Los Angeles Lakers, right? Do you see my point? Like, yeah, there have been some ugly blowouts against actually good teams, but you've also like 
been really close against some good teams. He lost by one point to Atlanta. Do you know how many games this team has lost either in overtime? You you took the OKC Thunder to overtime, double overtime. That's that that's the best team in the West according to a lot of people, right? You got blown out by New Orleans the next night. Was a back to back. Yes, you know. Um, you get smoked by Cleveland, you get smoked by San Antonio, but then you lose by two to Indiana, which is the best team of that bunch. Well, actually, it's the second best team of that bunch. My point being that this is the way that you would construct a tank if you could construct a tank in any way that you wanted to. Anyway, we have time for one caller and let's make it Lil John. Lil John, what's going on, man? Your mic is off. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. How you doing, man? I've been better. I had, like I had to postpone this live because I had a you know like when you sleep on a pillow or something, not not a, not a pillow. Like I slept on a cover or something, and I had this like sleep line on my face. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I have to give like thirty minutes for this deep sleep line to go away because like I think four minutes to go in the fourth quarter, I was just done. I just passed out. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> it's funny that I'm I'm like one of the only guys who still calls, but I'm not even like all the way locked in as well. Like I'm missing like quarters at a time, which I never do. Yeah, I'm kind of just walking off, walking on, coming back, and it feels it's just it's easy to just walk off on this on this team. But I still dude, like I just it. I watched a movie today called Downsizing. I don't know if you've seen it with um, Matt Damon. And no, I, I got to tell you, for like the trailer and the first 25 minutes of that movie, I was hooked. I was like, oh, my God, I got I to gotta watch this movie. This is great. You know, and I, I was curious. I was like, how have I not watched this movie yet? It's a 2017 movie. It, it it seems so great. And then I read the reviews and it said really has a really terrible second half. And I was like, oh, how bad could it be? It's so great so far. And then, man. I got to tell you, this might be like the first movie that I watched 97% of it. And I got, I was like, I don't even fucking care about the last 3%. Fuck the last 3%. <laughs> Downsizing is the equivalent of what the Raptors feel like right now, which is like, you've done so many stupid things and so many, I don't want to say stupid things. It's just, there's so lack of interest because the outcome is so inevitably obvious and inconsequential. It doesn't even matter. Like if this was NBA 2K, I would have started simming the season like two months ago. Just like, you know, like sim, 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 sim. I just, I'm not curious. I'm not, I don't care about the 19 point Jordan Noir game. Like all of this is constructed to be a development rep, you know? So it, in a weird way, it's, it's less, I'm less interested in this than I was in the Raptors summer league. Way less interested. Yeah, like a thousand percent less interested. The, sum, the summer league, at least, is like you were. You've been depraved of uh, sports for a few, for a few or Raptors basketball for a few months, and then you're watching the, the latest picks. So it's like, it's meaningful. This this is like we're 65 games in, and I'm like I'm more I'm tired of it. Yeah. You know. Well, let's predict the Raptors' record at the end of the year, shall we? So, okay. Right now we have a game coming up against Sacramento. <laughs> okay, see the next two. The next two are losses for sure. Okay, so we got two L's. Okay, so we got. Oh, okay. I'm I'm just gonna count the losses on my hands, and I think I'm gonna run out of hands. Okay, so Sacramento loss. LL. LL. You think we beat so the, the Wizards? Next, so the next two, well, they're gonna try their hardest to lose to the Wizards and the Nets. To me, it's, it's about... It's unfortunate gonna, we don't have another game against uh, the Grizzlies because I feel like a game against the Grizzlies right now would be like game seven of the playoffs. That, that, that would be so entertaining. Like, I feel like people would be locked in on that one. It would just be like... <laughs> both teams would just trot out like guys off the street. they will just be <laughs> signing new guys. they will just signing guys from LA Fitness. <laughs> <laughs> I know some guys. I know some guys who could do it. Yeah. That'd be great. That 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 would have been so. I actually wish they there was one more game left. But bro, so tickets tickets against uh, Washington tickets as low as eleven dollars, and it's still a ripoff. It's still a ripoff. <laughs> I think they're aren't they moving the team to Virginia? Washington? Aren't they moving the team? Is, is it, wasn't that, isn't that a thing? I I don't know. I think yeah it, that 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 was the that was a thing like a month ago. 
Okay. I, I clearly, uh, I might've been focused on pendants during that time. Maybe I missed it. Um, yeah. Okay. So, I mean. To, to me, this is about, it's about um, the games that, the 50-50 games. Because th- all the games that like Sacramento, Oklahoma City, those are. I feel, like, New York, I feel like there are a couple of games uh, you Philly, might be missing. Los Angeles, because Los, Los Angeles is playing for their life right now. So those sure. are all guaranteed. L's. The, but the Wizards at Brooklyn on April 10th. In the Miami games, hopefully they're playing for something. Hopefully they're not, you know, playing, you know, DeLon Wright and stuff in those games. But that's well, I really mean, the, season. the season's about those six, five, six games of uh, where the games are up for grabs because every, all the other games are guaranteed losses and they're going to try their hardest to lose those anyways. Yeah. I mean, I watched the Miami Heat play tonight, today. And I was expecting them to lose because they were like, without Jimmy Butler, they're without Tyler Hero. I was like, whoa, this team is not going to be one. And, and they still beat the Pistons at full health with Jaden Ivey, with you, Kate Cunningham, with Jalen Dern. You watched that game? I didn't watch it. I watched the clips and I was surprised out of my mind because I was like, man, if there's ever a game that Detroit is going to win and it's like such a, you know, morale builder of, oh, we beat Miami, even though Miami didn't play anybody. But it's like, nope, Jaime Jaquez is enough, you know, (laughs) like that's enough to beat the Pistons right now. And that's depressing. That's a depressing thought if you're a Pistons fan, because I believe the game was in Am I, am I mistaken? Was the game in Detroit? I'm pretty sure the game was in Detroit. The game so. was in Detroit, and Cade had uh, the ball with, you know, the shot clock off, and he decided to take a, a shot with nine seconds left. Jesus Christ. And that's how they lost. You know, losing on a Bam at a bio half-court shot, that has to feel like death. Yeah, no doubt. Okay, let's see here. <laughs> So Bam hit a half court shot. You didn't see it? He hit a no, I didn't. Oh my god! Oh, oh shit! People were getting, people were clowning Cade. He he took he took a shot with nine seconds left with the shot clock off, for no reason. Wait, were you watching the the, the Nuggets game? That's why. Yes. Okay, because they were they were on at the same time. Yeah, like that's that's crazy. Wow. I didn't realize it was this close. I mean, to 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 be fair, I had stacked so many parlay bets that the Pistons would win this game. Oh, like no, they could have. Damn, bro! Like we're talking like thirty-six to one type of parlay bets. Like if they had won, like I think I would have bought a new TV. Somehow mm-hmm. I ended up like plus today, regardless of that. But it was like very because because Vegas gave them no shot when this game was close. It was like, boom, seven to one odds to win this game. And I was like, man, like they could make it close. And they are the more talented team right now in theory. But yeah, Bam Adebayo and Jaime Hakez, that's enough. Um, yeah, Cade's uh, his string of uh, great, really good. He had a nice little stretch there. He's kind of came back down to earth. Yeah, I mean, Isaiah Stewart. uh like shit, man. Like you got so many lottery players on this team. But yeah, like I mean, Bam Adebayo definitely the best player in this game. You make a case, Duncan Robinson might be the second best player in this game. So I mean, shit. Like that's crazy. Thirty points for Duncan Robinson. Like he's he's good. He did just, wow. Yeah, that's wild. Can I give you a take on the Raptors Orlando? Sure. So I'm watching the game tonight, and you know they played again on uh, on Friday. So mm-hmm. for some reason, it feels like the teams are linked together, even though they're really not. Uh-huh. Maybe it's because of, maybe it's because of Suggs and Scotty. Maybe it's because of the you know the kids on the internet comparing uh, Scotty and uh you know the, their best players. Maybe it's because of Jeff Weltman, but it feels like they're linked. And really, the only link is the Raptors are young and they're young. To right. watch both of them, to watch both teams kind of like going in opposite directions. And I personally believe that the Raptors have the best player between the two. But the fact that they have so many players that are just, they have. So- Hello? You muted yourself. Yeah, the fact that they have so many good players and the Raptors only have one. I don't think the Raptors only have one, and I don't think they have so many. 
How how big a gap do you think there is between Jalen Suggs and Manuel Quickly or Jalen Suggs and you know RJ Barrett? I don't think it's that huge a gap. I think there's a pretty big gap between Suggs and Quickly. I don't know about that, man. I think I think you can make a case that Franz and Paolo would clearly be two and three um, between the two rosters. I also disagree with the fact that they're going in different directions. I think they're on different timelines. Like, you have to realize how bad the Magic have been for the last five years. Like, there's a reason they picked in the lottery so many times. Now, you can argue they picked two lottery guys last year. They had two lottery guys in 2021. They had the number one pick in 2022. Like, of the last five years, they've had four, five guys, five guys in the top 11 picks. And two guys, three guys in the top five picks. You should have an accumulation of young talent. Can you imagine if the Raptors had picked that many top lottery picks? In comparison, over the last five years, or sorry, the last three years, the Raptors have picked fourth with Scotty. They didn't have a draft pick in 2022. And then they picked 13th in 2023. So that's really the gap right now that you're seeing. But to, to me, the gap is they have one of the best guards off the bench they have one literally um mo wagner might be the best big off the bench in the entire nba they have the best defensive player coming off the bench mm -hmm. by far by far uh, jonathan isaac is the best bench defender in the nba that's the gap everyone who they play could play on any team right almost outside of gary harris and even him even he could play he, he could be like an eighth man Okay. That's yeah, fair. Gap. I think that's fair, but also, like, I think it's worth noting that, again, these are two teams in very different places, right? Like, they're just, they're not on the same timeline. You know, yeah, you're, ta you're talking about a team that has been building up this uh, <laughs> base of young Sorry, are you doing are you doing something with your mic? Like you're just moving around a lot or something? Yeah, I was just moving. On, I, I okay. Said. Yeah. So, like, you could you could talk about these teams being in two different place uh, places, uh, different timelines, etc. Um, the Raptors have, you know, picks coming up this year. There are potentially three picks coming up this year. I don't think the Magic have any first round picks this year. Do they have any first round picks? They might have like a like a. Just so I was going to say the, 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 the good thing for the Raptors is or the, or the bad thing for the Magic is they did not hit on any of their players from the last year's pick uh, last year's draft because I think they got two of the worst players in the in the lottery. Anthony Black. I'm not an Anthony Black guy at all. That's cool. I am. Um, and the Jet Howard. I'm very low on Jet Howard. Jet Howard. I, sucked, I am. Pre I'm pretty low. College. I don't think he sucked in college, but his, I'm pretty low on him as well. Sucked. What? His advanced numbers were like all-time bad in college. All-time bad? Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. But I I mean they weren't great, but you can you can make a case that he fit something what they were looking for in terms of as a shooter and a playmaker and ball handler and his handle is pretty interesting. I will say that they will regret not taking Grady or um or lively or, or Jordan or, Hawkins or, or Casey Wallace. They didn't have the option to take. Did they have the option to take live? Oh shit! They had the option to take lively. Yeah, yes. with, the, with the black pick. Yeah, they fucked up bad. That's that's the scary part. They could have been even better, or they could have took Keontae George. So I mean, how many I mean, how many how many ball dominant guards do you want to have on the same team? You know. You already have Jalen Suggs. You already have Paolo, you know, Franz. I don't know if they ball dominant, but like guards. I mean, does Keontae really fit the need more than Jet Howard does in this case? I think, you know, yeah, um, and uh, Ninja saying, I think you're confusing Jet for Jalen Hood Shafino. Mm, I don't no, think he is, but um, Jalen Hood Shafino is like to me, that's one guy that I think if we do this draft again in a couple of years, he doesn't go first round. That's just my thought right now. He might yeah, get better. I, I feel that way about Jet, and I know I know he hasn't played yet, but I had him like kind of, I think 18, 19, 20 ish. So picking him at eleven was it felt like a reach for me, 
I like had Pots, Potschemski. Remember, he's going over him. Hawkins is going over him. Grady's uh, Grady's going over him. Um, it's still very early, man. Like, I mean, look, I trust Jeff Weltman to draft well. He gets talent more often than not. He drafts pretty well. That being said, he's had some pretty big screw ups in the draft. I don't think anyone would argue that Jalen Suggs was the best player available at five. No matter how his career is going to turn out. The only reason that you can make case, I think when I did my redraft, I had him like higher than Cade and people lost their minds. <laughs> yeah, I'd I'd stick I stick by that. I stick by that. Like Detroit fans. Hmm? I'd rather have Suggs. Yes, I would too, because, you know, here's a player who's actually contributing to winning, um, you know, and has drastically shifted his game to make that happen. And, you know, again, like I would love Jalen Suggs on this team. Like, I would love it. Like in so place of like a plethora of players like i yeah i would rather have him than a lot of players on this team but that so being that's, said that's a ahead. good thing that's a that's a thing that i was thinking about like as as much as people are down on Masai, Masai, some of his like who he's been linked to he was linked to jalen suggs last year he was linked mm -hmm. to uh nick claxton like two three years ago he so he, his his uh his eye for talent is still like he, he's still he still got his fastball because I think the Raptors. I mean, if you if you need evidence for that, he was linked to Shea Gilgis Alexander and Giannis Antetokounmpo. Like, so I mean, yeah, he he gets it, and he tried to trade for those guys. So it's not yeah. linked to because you be linked to a million people. It's like, did you did you do something? Did you try to do something? Did it just you know fall out of your hands? And I think if he can go back in time, you know, okay, you don't trade for Shea, but you end up trading for Kawhi instead, and you win a championship. Fine, maybe you live with that result because let's be honest, there are teams that have existed for forty years that won't win a championship, and there are teams that won't win an extra. There are teams right now. There is a fan of some team right now at the age of twenty. Okay, he's twenty years old, and he's like, my team is going to win a championship, and he's going to die before his team wins a championship. Probably is that's very likely. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. And and that fan like is Hornets probably fan. Hmm? a Hornets fan, probably like a Wizards a fan. fan, a Hornets or a Wizards fan, probably. But yeah, one of those teams is probably not going to win a championship over the next twenty years, especially if you have like a dynasty that forms where you know one team just sweeps up like six, seven in a in a in a ten year span, and that team is probably going to be OKC or San Antonio. But that being said, I think the Raptors are like okay. So here's a question. For you, would you swap? Like, let's just say I'm Jeff Waltman, you're Masai Ujiri. I call you and I say, hey, Masai, you want to make the craziest deal of all time? I will trade you every player on my roster, every player on my roster, including Paolo, Franz, everybody, and every pick I own for the next five years for every player on your roster and every pick you own for the next five years. You making that trade? See, again. You're trading three picks this year for, for, for one. That's, I think that's they worth have, noting. They have all their picks, though. They do, but they have the 21st pick um, this, this year draft. in this year's draft. And that's, you that's have nothing. two. I mean, potentially, if you keep your lottery pick, you have two picks that are better than their picks. Yeah. That's uh, something. So, and they're going to so, be consistently pretty good. And now, now the question is, are they going to be good enough to be champions? I don't think so. I don't think they're going to yeah. be better than Boston. And I don't think Paolo is the best player on the championship team. Right. Exactly. So, 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 so that's my question. Oh, is do, do you make that trade? So, again, I think Scotty is better than both of their best players. Mm -hmm. Pretty soundly. That being said, you have two guys, in my opinion, who are going to be top 30 players in the NBA one day. I don't and know. Paolo if you and France? That. Yeah. Pretty certainly two guys and the Raptors have won weirdly enough I'm more certain about Franz hitting that outcome than Paolo but yeah I mean Paolo I might mean, already be like knocking on the door right now so maybe I'm just like I'm just biased. that's my point I, I like Franz better just I just love Franz the cutting the the defense he's uh, the shot uh, do you see him airball a shot today who Franz yeah he's shooting like 29 percent and his shots are like if you talk to magic fans they're like they're they're kind of frightened look because he i saw him airball a shot like and it was an ugly airball it was like a precious airball it could it happen to bad. anybody but it, so yeah i would i would i think i'd be i'd take the magic's roster just because off the interesting the fact that off the fact that i have two guys who 
I'm pretty sure are top 30 players. Just off that. And then Suggs. I, I value Suggs over anyone. Outside of that group. Okay. So yeah. So if you were doing like a fantasy draft of the Raptors and Magic entire roster, your first pick would be Scotty. Your second pick would be Franz or Paolo. Your third pick yeah. would be Franz or Paolo. Your fourth pick would be Suggs. Yep. And then Grady. And then Grady would be the fifth pick. Okay. Yeah, that's that. Grady look, I think that's a that's a pr- that's a pretty sound uh, conclusion. I think you might be a little bit lower on Emmanuel Quickly and R.J. Barrett than than I am, which is. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm not liking what I'm seeing from quickly. The separation. I mean, again, you can't expect somebody like if you force Jalen Suggs to I know, initiate uh, I mean, an offense as they have it. multiple times, it. dude, that guy would get fucking cremated. Okay. I get it. I get it. But, but Suggs is a defensive player, though. No, I understand that. But Emmanuel quickly is not a defensive sieve. He's not Suggs, okay? Jalen no, Suggs has a poten- Jalen Suggs has the potential to be one of the top three guard defenders in the NBA for the next ten years. Uh, Emmanuel yeah. quickly does not possess anywhere near that level of potential defensively, but he's also not bad, and he'll be in the upper echelon. Let's say the upper half of guard defenders, given the way point guards defend nowadays, he'll be one of the. 12 to 15 best starting point guard defenders in the NBA for the next 10 sure. years. Sure. But... And, and and so like, the, so you hold water with a guy like that. It's not Anthony Simons level bad. It's not Damian Lillard bad. It's not Trey Young bad. And I know I'm comparing him to the absolute dumps, but I think when you put better defenders around him, I've seen very capable defense from him in New York. So he retains the possibility of being very interesting defensively. I just think he needs to get stronger. He gets cross matched need- way too often. Yeah, he gets and and that's the thing with Suggs is like the Suggs possesses that Dwayne Wade, Gary Payton trait, where he can guard up like two positions. Like if Jalen Suggs can cross match on a small forward, I'm not worried about Jalen Suggs. If he gets cross match on a center, I'm a little more worried. But I still feel like he's going to give it about as good a shot as any wing would. So weirdly enough, at six foot three and a half, six foot four, Suggs possesses the ability to guard four positions and that's pretty freaking impressive at that size um where would herb where would herb jones and trey murphy go in this fantasy draft would they go over Suggs? oh yeah they're they're clear top four and potential potential to get to top three um but uh definitely top four Trey Murphy huh. would look really good on the Raptors. Just, just yeah. So, so that's that's, that's, that, that, that's my point. So, I feel like the Raptors We're missing right a now guy like that. You're exactly. You're missing your Franz Wagner. That's my point. Yeah, we're missing someone because the minute play. you get Franz Wagner, now here's here's the point. You have expirings like Bruce Brown and Chris Boucher. You have a boatload of draft picks, especially if you keep this one, and you have in my opinion, probably the better executive in Masai Ujiri and Bobby Webster. That team feels to me like they have a better handle on scouting talent than Jeff Weltman and Anthony Parker do. That being said, I will trust that you can find a Franz Wagner level talent or develop one. And, And you have three potential, like, if you think the gap between Franz Wagner and RJ Barrett is substantial at this point, like you're projecting, you're big. projecting upside. I, I think promise. It's big. Yeah, I think it's pretty big. <laughs> defensively, it's pretty big, bro. Defensively, Franz is pretty damn good defensively, and RJ sucks. Or RJ doesn't suck, but like he's a negative, pretty big negative. And one guy's a plus, and a six nine and long arms. If so, you're gonna be low on if you're gonna be low on France, it's I'm not short. low on France. I like Franz no. Wagner. No, no, I um, mean, like if the in general, if you're gonna be low on him, you you're gonna be you're gonna you're saying to yourself, this shot isn't gonna develop like people think. That's the that's yeah. the only downside on him. So here's Franz Wagner according to Crafton. He is legitimately like I think a rational person could say he has a point to be in the conversation with Scotty and Paolo. He's actually in that conversation firmly. He he might even be better analytically than those two guys. 
Um, uh, he there's a couple analytics that like him better, but most analytics like Scotty better. Right. But I'm saying like he's a hell of a talent, and clearly like he's one yeah, of the yeah. top guys here. He he's in terms of RJ Barrett. Yeah, shit's it worse. Just looks a lot. It looks a lot. It looks much. Different. It is worse. He's he's he like and, and and to anyone saying you know like, oh my god, so like, but here's the point. It's like the gap is a really inefficient third option versus a really efficient second option. As opposed to, this is Shaquille O'Neal and this is Brad Miller. You know what I mean? This is not a superstar. But I mean, yeah, does, right. does Franz Wagner possess superstar level upside? So, I feel so like he pos- I, I feel like he possesses four time All Star upside, and I feel like that's, that's RJ Barrett possesses if something goes very right for him, two time All Star pos- uh, like upside. Yeah, now yeah, you I might think agree. like it's impossible that he's ever going to make an All Star team. I feel like I've watched players similar to him turn it around. So I hope that RJ Barrett does figure it out. But yes, his defensive analytics have been atrocious all year. Um, they got worse after he got to the Raptors. Considerably worse, actually. He's been so much worse defensively as a Raptor. Offensively, though, he's been much better as a Raptor. So go figure. Um, I don't so know. I, I, I had a theory for you. or So I don't know if you've been paying attention to how bad Mikel Bridges is playing. Like every night he's going five for 17 from the field. Would you package the sixth pick with a contract and maybe the, the Pacers pick for him? I feel because like you now, asked me about Mikel Bridges before and I said no. And I, I, I did. I think I did. But I think it turned into a Brandon Ingram versus Mikel Bridges conversation. Just just strictly for Mikel, would you trade the sixth pick for him and a package around the six? Because he's he's the France, basically. No, he's not. He's older. He's smaller. He's, he's older, but he's older. He's but... worse. He's worse. He's um, older, smaller, and worse. How can you be equivalent to somebody if you're older, smaller, and worse? <laughs> so, so you would rather find it through the draft? I'll trust the Raptors. To f- there's there's such a okay. So so here's the thing. You look at a guy like Precious Achua, right? He's a great example. Um, a friend of mine has this obnoxious habit of messaging me every single day and asking me why we let go of Precious Achua. And I'm just like, oh, dude, how good do you think this guy is? Like, what what do you think is the max level upside on Precious Achua, right? He is really not as good as people are making him out to be based on his box score numbers in, in New York. And I do not understand why people keep messaging me like we just let go of fucking Hakeem Olajuwon in his prime like we did not he is a very interesting athlete he is definitely playing a ton of minutes he was a very big stopgap solution when OG was injured and he fits a role for them and in the cog it works but overall man there's like seven guys eight guys on the magic roster I'd rather have than him on a night to night basis maybe nine and it's like if we're talking about the 10th guy on a good team who the fuck are we talking about here like stop crying over the shit the He's second part about that is exactly the second part is it's a really bad fit for what you're trying to do offensively. And so is Boucher, and frankly, so is Gary Trent Jr., and possibly so is Bruce Brown. Like, there's not not Bruce Brown in theory is a great fit, but Gary Trent Jr. and Chris Boucher and Precious Chua, like guys like this, just they don't fit what you're trying to do and the type of basketball you're trying to play. However, I will say this: what are the odds? Just I'm saying, what are the, do you think is possible? That there is a player picked between 20 and 35 in next year's draft. 2025 or 2024? 2024. Sorry. So this year's. This year's. So between 20, between pick 20 and between pick 35, that there's one player picked in that group in the Peyton Watson, Walker Kessler, Nikola Jovic group, you know, the David Roddy range, the Christian Brown range, that range of the draft, you know, where where guys like that, Julian Strother, guys like this have historically gone. Your Jalen Williams, the second Jalen Williams. Um, your Christian Colocos, whatever. Jaden McDaniels. Jaden McDaniels, sure. So that entire range of the draft. What are the odds that there's a player picked this year in a week draft that is better after year one than Precious Achua will be after year four? What are the odds? I'd put the odds at – you're just saying one guy. It doesn't have to be just on Just one guy. You just have to find oh, one guy oh in God. that entire range of 15 <laughs> – 
come on. You already know the answer. The, the, the author, it's like 100%. 99%. Exactly. And that's my point. And the odds of that guy, and 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 I'd say the odds of Masai Ujiri finding that guy are substantially higher than most general managers who, who are drafting in that range. One. Two, if you do find that guy, I mean, number one, you'll have a few cracks at it because you have multiple picks in that range for the next couple of years. If you do find that guy, you'll have him on a rookie contract for four years. Mm. And, and that's my point. It's like good point. You are getting guys. Now here's here's the brilliant thing about the NIL deals, right? Guys are staying in college longer. And I love this. Especially for guys who should be staying in college longer. See, like you don't get a super long leash in the NBA. You just don't have this super long time to make it. Usually when you're in Malachi Flynn's position, and granted Flynn was a little bit older when he came in. Usually, I'd, I'd say Malachi Flynn is like, you know, like what what is today? Today is Sunday, March 17th. Malachi Flynn expired on March 4th. He's like milk in your fridge that expired like two weeks ago almost, you know? And it's just, it's it's done. It's It's been done for a while. And you should have thrown it out. And now it's sour yogurt. And that's my point. It's like, you don't get Malachi Flynn level opportunity in the NBA anymore. You just don't. There's too much talent. There's the world is too big. The G League is too, too many deep. People. There's so many people. There's 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 like, you know, honestly, if there was a round three of the NBA draft, like it would be chock full of players that have a chance. And that's my point. Undrafted heap is getting larger and larger. Here's a fun fact. Justin Champagne and Julian Champagne both started and played crazy uh, higher than 30 minutes uh, tonight in the NBA. They both started together? They started in different games, but on the same night, Justin and Julian both started. Justin played a team high wow. 35 minutes for uh, the Washington Wizards, and Julian obviously played for, this, uh, for the Spurs. Interesting. Yeah. That I say, I say that to say that both those guys were late picks and Justin was an undrafted guy. Those guys are getting minutes now, probably over some guy who was a first round pick who's out of the fucking league right now. There's a lot of guys. Usman Garuba was a first round pick. I'm pretty sure he's close to being out of the league and he's got tons of freaking athletic potential. Ty Ty Washington was a first round pick. I'm pretty sure his career is on like standby right now. Watch. So you take all these guys and you say at some point you do have to understand that the rotating chairs are going to make it so that guys who come into the league with a little bit more ready to go now are going to have a better better shot. Guys like Jaime Hawkins, guys like Brandon Pajinski, guys like Trace Jackson Davis. And you get these guys typically in this 20 to 35 range. I feel like this 20 to 35 range in the draft where the Raptors seem to have, you know, um, you can call it 15 to 35, where the Raptors have gotten two picks in this draft. I feel like one of these picks will be for probably a flyer, like a total athletic GG Jackson type. You know, like Kel let's just where? Hmm. The Kel Elware, Indiana. Maybe. I don't know. Have you seen him? No. The, he's the, he's a big on Indiana. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna see him. I'm looking forward to getting into draft analysis. This is gonna be like a really good shift in tone and concentration for me. And March Madness is gonna be a great time to get into it. Um, I feel like one of those players will be that, but I think the other player could, and I think that the Raptors could basically do what the Denver Nuggets did, right? It's take, take your safe bet and then take your athletic flyer and, you know, put the athletic flyer in, into the G league, right? Uh, to nine Oh five and have like a product that's really interesting to watch in the nine Oh five, you know, having a high potential 19 year old in the G league is something the Raptors really haven't had for a while. Like they had Grady Dick do some stints down there and he was struggling hard, but to have a guy like Pascal Siakam or something like that, you know, like, like having a guy who's like really dominating the G league and you know, he's next up and he's got like a real pathway. It's kind of interesting. So have yeah. that guy. And then on the other hand, have your Julian Strother type, your 22 year old who can be a role player right now. So, you know, replace your Jalen McDaniels, Jordan Nawara roster spot with basically a guy who's like a college senior who just, you know, is a really good player, but maybe has a bit of a diminished upside and then see how much more juice you can, ju you can juice out of that. Because the value of these first round picks in a league where this cap is spiking, to be able to pay a guy, you know, late first round pick, probably you're talking about like less than 1% of the cap 
like one ish percent of the cap. That's crazy. That is absolutely insane. Not one point five percent of the cap. Like to to have one roster spot at least where a guy can play fifteen minutes for you in a pinch, especially if you're injured or whatever. And for four years to have con- control over that. Um, spooky Ghost Rider saying Zach Eady, yes or no? No. Hell no. I don't want to say hell no because I've been wrong about bigs before, but I'm inclined to say no. He feels I mean, very he's slow. Not big. He's not a he's not an actual big. He's like he's a special too big. That's fair. He's just he's gonna just he's just gonna come in and you know try to change the pace of the game. I don't think he's actually gonna play. You know, not to disrespect him. Um, yeah, I, I think that's that's a that's a fair point. Um. I don't know about wasting a roster spot on that though. Yeah. A taco fall. Like, is that necessarily like, like what is the point? I feel like every year there's some big, uh, um, yeah, those, those never work out. I don't want to say they never work out because dominant college bigs have worked out. I just don't think the Jaleel Okafor slow footed types work out. And Edie, you know, I just want to be clear. If this is 15 years ago, Zach is going top five in this draft. He might be going number one in this draft. You think so? If this was fifteen to twenty years ago, yes, I do. You think he? You think he's skilled enough offensively? I, I haven't watched him enough, uh, to be honest. But he would go top five. I don't want to go to number one, but he would go top five because players like him um, have gone higher before. Like he reminds me of Pavel Podkolzin or Eric Montras. Rest in peace, Eric Montras. I believe Eric Montras passed away. So rest yeah, in peace. Yeah, he did. Um, but. Yeah, like he reminds me of guys like that, like where in a in a substantially bigger league where there were Shaqs and, you know, David Robinsons of the world. Okay, so we're talking maybe 25 years ago, 30 years ago, 30 years ago. Okay, let's not say 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I feel like he would have gone top five, top six in the draft. Um, JLA Media saying uh, Montra, uh, ED is not Montras. Actually, he's been literally compared to Eric Montras, number one. Number two, have you watched Eric Montrose play in college? Because you should, because he was a very different player in college. I feel like people get like really twisted about who who a guy is based on who what he played in the NBA. Most of the guys who played in the NBA, like consider like I don't know, like fuck, um, Patrick Beverly. You know, Patrick Patrick Beverly averaged like thirty seven points per game in high school. Like, people don't think of him as a scorer, but if you watch him in high school, you think of him as a scorer. So it's just like. Yes, I did. As in, yes, you watched Eric Montras in 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 college for real. How old are you? I'm very curious now. Uh, this is a very okay, uh, little John. The 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 whatever you're doing with your mic, man, it's super disruptive. Like you're you're like scraping your mic. I don't know what's going on with that. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Just just yeah, just it's it's very disruptive. Uh, JLA right. Media saying I'm 50 years old. Okay, so you watched Eric Montrose in high school. We, uh, in college, would you say that the college game was substantially bigger and so an advantage that a guy like Eric Montrose would have had in college game like 35, 40 years ago might be diminished in today's game? See what I mean? Like, Zach Eady is just huge. Like, he is going up against centers that are just nowhere near his size. And they're pounding it inside. Purdue is pounding it inside and getting him, like, efficient looks. And he's, you know... D- I'm just sorry, like, if you put him next to a guy who can actually, like, it, he's just too slow defensively. He's just too slow defensively. Like, if it, Kyrie Irving and Derek Lively, just think about Zach Eady guarding a Kyrie Irving, Derek Lively pick and roll, or a Luca Derek Lively pick and roll. It would be an automatic two points every single time. He's By the way, huge. I don't, know no, you, I don't know if you thought this during the game tonight, uh, today, but... I think of all the teams, people are trying to figure out which team would give Denver the biggest issues. I, I again, I don't think any team is beating Denver, but I think Dallas, I think Luca in the pick and roll attacking Jokic would just completely, you know, you're getting like 1.3, 1.4 possessions out of that every single time. I think that's the best way to play with Denver because I, I think they would. I don't, I don't think, I don't even think they played that well today. And they still Denver? I thought Denver didn't play well at all either, but Dallas won. I know I, I Dallas won, but I don't think they played that well. 
don't they think they played that well either. Here's the thing. Dallas is also pretty new to each other. They're integrating, you know, a pretty substantial piece in PJ Washington. And I think like, you know, yeah. PJ might anyway. not be that good though. I think he fits. Yeah. Anyways, man, any final thoughts? Um, are you still like, are you still intrigued by Ochai? I'm intrigued by what he could be as potentially a Tony He's, Allen type change yeah, of pace. So the, the, the expectations are changing for him because Tony Allen, I, I thought this guy could shoot and he can't shoot. He will, the, be, he, he will be able to shoot, man. I, I've seen his shot for him. It's perfectly fine. It's just, it's not going in right now, whatever. Um, he's had substantial samples in the NBA where he has shot well from the corners. He needs to be a corner shooter who expands his game to be a little bit better. I see encouraging signs from him, and I see a development staff that believes in him, and I see a guy who's bought in. Look, he's getting minutes and reps. He's playing well above his pay grade right now. And if he's starting for you next season, you're, you're, you're dead. Um, but if he's your eighth, ninth guy, like you're going to have to find some way to replace Gary Trent Jr. at some point, right? And, and I'm not saying that he's going to be able to replace his shot making, but man, he flashes some stuff defensively sometimes where it's like, if he can put that together for a full game, he has stopper potential. So we'll, well see. Why does, why does Gary like some random nights just show that he can play on ball defense and then, you know, and then it'll just go away for months? He's he never is. had the lateral speed or size or strength to play to play competitive. Um, I think it's just sometimes the matchup is is going to allow him to get a little bit closer without the guy dusting him. Yeah, because when you put him out. against an again elite elite matchup, he's gonna he's gonna struggle ten times out of ten. I think. Um, I think yeah, his defensive end. Yeah. I think it's yeah. So like he was that, he was getting under his handle. That's all. That's, That's it exactly, and I mean it's just a really bad matchup, all, all, honestly. And, and in the playoffs, I always think about like playoffs, and I feel like in the playoffs, I feel like a guy like Gary can get schemed out defensively pretty badly. Yeah, um, it, it would and, and 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 ditto for RJ. And I think like to everyone who's like, and again, prayers out to RJ and his family. And this is like I, I've been very very hesitant to say anything negative about RJ, you know, um, over the last just a few days because it's just some things are just bigger than basketball. But just to be completely objective on the analysis of him, like he is the worst defender in the starting lineup. That features. He's worse than Gary. Yeah, it's close. It's honestly it's really close. close. And it, it's like part of it is he's worse because he's guarding harder matchups. Um, he's taken on like some really really hard matchups. But I think like his defensive lapses, team defensive stuff, the rim defense. Like he he has some serious gaps to shore up defensively. And I've seen this before with Damar. I've seen this before with guys like if they don't want to defend it, they don't have a natural, you know, skill for moving their feet laterally. Like he he's like a north south athlete. East west, he's just very yeah. rigid. It's very so bad. He, yeah, he doesn't get like enough flexibility on the side. Like I, I just with Ochai, I see like the, the upside of it, right? But now, like, if Ochai doesn't become a great defender for you, you have Jordan Nawara, who's, okay, substantially better than G Gary and uh, RJ, but still not a defensive stopper. You have Scotty Barnes, who's substantially better than all these guys, but also not, like, the, he's, not in, he's not in the top 2% of perimeter defenders at all. Like, so he's not, he's not OG and an OB Herb Jones where he's just like, oh yeah, that's, that's fucking prime Michael Jordan, Scotty Pippen. He can just, you know, he can clean up two, two positions for yeah, you. He he's can't. not part of attack. Right. And he, he's better than those guys though. I'll tell you that. Scotty, yeah, for all the black he catches for point of attack stuff, he's still the best defender on this team. And that's a problem because he used to be the second or third best defender on your team. And now he's the best defender in your team. And and again, once again, you're asking a guy to level up above their pay grade. Scotty cannot be a defensive anchor for you. Just he cannot be a defensive anchor for you and an offensive hub for you in the same. There's no one in the league that does that for their team. Literally nobody. There's no one who is the team's best offensive player and defensive player. And, you know, that's just tough. Anyways, man. Um, sorry, the, the mic stuff is just it's very, very distracting. So I'm Can gonna you have still to hear it? 
yeah yeah it's it's constant it's been constant throughout this call like where like every two minutes there's just like a tapping of the mic or a rubbing of the mic and yeah it's just like maybe maybe if you're gonna call in just just make sure not to do that because it, it can get very distracting it's like a tip 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 you know what's funny one of my i I, I have one of my airpods i'm using one of my airpods and i think the other one is somewhere maybe it's i don't know maybe it's being fiddled with or something so i don't know oh okay that might make sense yeah yeah technology what are you gonna do Anyways, uh, thanks a lot for calling in, man. Always appreciate yeah. it. Cheers. Yeah, man. Thank you, man. Have a good one. See ya. Okay. And that's it for this live. Um, definitely consider subscribing if you haven't already. We got 200 people tuned in um, on a Sunday night at 11.38. And I can tell you, as someone who is monitoring this pretty closely, that I don't even think they're like, there's no live in the world uh focus on the raptors and, and the magic on a sunday night that's getting this kind of traction so i appreciate y'all for showing up for keeping the chat lively um i realize this community is not really about me i realize this community is a place for you guys to talk amongst each other you know amongst yourselves discuss ideas i hope this live has been entertaining i think we touched on a lot of stuff the conversation was pretty you know decent i think it went in a lot of good places i think the raptors will be fine i'm getting kind of tired of saying it i feel like i've been saying for 40 games now be patient trust the process it's going to be fine it's going to be fine it's going to be fine but it is it is um you know i've learned uh throughout my life that um things get really bad before they get really good and sometimes like the worse it gets the better it's about to become and this process of unearthing things and, you know, have you ever walked into an apartment? You know, I'll give you an example. I bought my place um, when I was pretty young. I, I saved like a crazy person. I worked crazy during high school and I bought this place when I was 21. So when properties in Toronto were pretty cheap. So yeah, I like wasn't like millionaire or anything like that. I just made a really smart investment in a in a place that I thought was not very uh, expensive and very reasonably priced in an older building. And so the first day I saw it, I was like, oh my God, this place is mine. I'm so excited. And, you know, it was great. And then the next day we tore it apart. So we want to rip out the floors, want to rip out the, the walls and do, do all this crazy shit. And I gotta tell you, man, when I walked into this place, the first day construction started and everything just was like up in the air and uh, you know all the parquet floor had come up and everything's like being cleared up in bags and my boy lewis was like you know he was like you know raking some stuff up and we had the tiles and the and the saw everywhere i had to tell you i looked around at this place that i just bought and i thought i had just bought like a war zone you know it just looked terrible i don't know if you've ever seen a house or an apartment that has just been torn down completely but I felt like I had just walked into like a tornado disaster zone, you know, and, and it was it was a gut punch moment of like, how will this ever get better? How will this ever look like better than what it was yesterday? You know, because it was it was it was fine yesterday before we tore everything out. It was fine. You know, everything's fine. And then you tear it apart and it's just it's terrible. It's fucking terrible for like two weeks. But then three weeks later after we were done the construction and we laid out the floors and you know we put in the wall and we fixed the counter and everything dude i i remember opening up the blinds letting the sun soak in and i just lay on the ground on this brand new laminate floor that i had just learned to put in myself and i just thought to myself this feels like home but for two and a half weeks it felt like a war zone and it was just like Every single day, it looked like shit. It looked like shit. It looked like shit. It looked like shit. It was like there was grout everywhere, buckets everywhere, garbage bags everywhere, like debris everywhere, dust everywhere, paint everywhere. Oh my god, it was it was terrible. And then one day, the last day, it was just great. It was just beautiful. You know, always be thankful for that day. Um, but that's why so few people ever do that. That's why so many people live in relationships that make them unhappy because being lonely is the equivalent of tearing apart your life. So many people want to, like, I've talked to people who've been out of love with people that they've been married to for 20 years. 20 years. 
20 years of your life to spend with somebody that you don't love, you don't care about that much, but you're just like, I don't want to go through the proceeding of divorce. I don't want to go through the proceeding of separation. I don't want to split half my shit. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Think about people who walked into the wrong line of work, right? You just keep going, going, hoping it's going to get a little more tolerable, a little more tolerable. And it doesn't. It just, it's like a growing sense of sadness. Last year to me was like that. It was a divorce that needed to happen. It was very messy. And look, there's one thing I'll tell you. And this is something that I think I've always been pretty good at. When I meet people who have a big decision in their life that they're putting off, I'm pretty good at identifying what that decision is and how to take the next step forward. That might mean somebody who needs to ask for a promotion. That might mean someone who needs to retire, somebody who needs to change their habits, change their health, change their diet, change their relationship, change something. It's ironic because as much as I'm able to give out the advice, I so often find that I'm someone who needs to do that for myself too. So this metamorphosis of change, when you toss out a whole bunch of shit and you change a whole bunch of habits, I think this is a very messy, uncomfortable, disruptive, sometimes destructive process. And that's what the Raptors season is for me. I will always remember this as the course correction that the Raptors, uh, the two years overdue course correction that the Raptors needed to take. And I know a lot of people are critical of Darko. And I know a lot of people are critical of RJ. And I know a lot of people are critical of Kelly or whoever. You know, and it's like, what are these guys? Blah, blah, blah. It looks messy right now. But at some point, those shots are going to start to fall. Those passes are going to start to hit. The habits that you're building right now and the habits that you're disrupting, they're going to pay fruit. And at some point, I think you're going to see a team and you're going to think it was an overnight success. And it's not an overnight success. What you're watching right now is part of the success. Um, I may have touched on this a few lives ago, but I'll say it again here. We have a really top-down approach to analyzing life, analyzing basketball. However, when you look at things bottom-up, they do change substantially. The pursuit of happiness is destined to fail. Every time, every time. The pursuit of happiness is miserable. The happiness of pursuit is blissful every time. Every time. You have to understand that this entire process of unearthing things is going to be uncomfortable and messy. But at some point, you had to do it because accumulation of crap, you know, it's like a detox. You would do a diet detox. It's uncomfortable. It's messy. You know, you might throw up. It's required. Yeah. Because we asked for this. Yes, we did. Because right now, I look down the books and I see no Fred Van Vliet making $40 million next year. And I consider that a massive success. Does that mean that I think Fred Van Vliet is not a better player than Manny Quickly? No, of course I think he's a better player than Manny Quickly right now. He is a better player than Manny Quickly right now. Right now, at the age of 30, making $40 million with his personality and his leadership traits. But I would vastly prefer Emmanuel quickly, the player, the asset, and the person on my team. Vastly. You know? So again, you take out overpriced assets and you replace them with underpriced assets. And you know, you you roll the dice on hopefully a few things breaking your way. There's always going to be some element of luck involved here. Luck is Scotty Barnes gets injured. That's bad luck. Maybe it's good luck. Is it, you know, maybe you keep your pick. There's no way in hell you're keeping that pick if Scotty Barnes doesn't get injured. I'll tell you that right now. Like one of these games against Orlando, he was going to just beat the crap out of the Orlando Magic and win the game for you. And definitely, like, I feel like the Raptors have two to three more wins right now if Scotty's healthy. However, because he's not healthy, um, you also don't get to see what could have been, you know, a metamorphosis or, you know, because um, Emmanuel quickly is finally going. You know, we're seeing that and, and we're seeing positive chemistry between those two. Could those two have like two man teamed like a 10 game win streak or something crazy like that? Who knows? We'll never know. But what we do know is that Scotty is going to come into this, uh, you know, come into the he's going to go into the summer rested that he's working right now on his stuff. According to Brian, he's working right now on his stuff and he's getting better. And look, man, like next year, like I put us over the Hornets. 
even with all their young talent, Brandon Ingram, whatever. Sorry, not Brandon Ingram, Brandon Miller and uh, Lamelo Ball and Miles Bridges or whoever. I put them over that team. I put them over the Wizards. I put them over the Pistons. I put them over like a lot of teams. I vastly prefer our future to a lot of teams in in the East. There might be three teams in the East that I think has have a brighter future right now. And again, the Raptors are in a position where with assets, with draft assets, cap flexibility, et cetera, that maybe they can just stack one Franz Wagner level piece. And let's say asking for a lot because obviously Franz is a very, very good player. But that level of talent, however it looks, however, what position he plays, but that level of prospect talent, put that player on this team, allow this team to flourish and function under Darko Ryakovic and see how the, how beautiful this thing could be. Because I think as early as next year, it could result in 42 wins. I think maybe by, by the year after, it might result in 55 wins. And then who knows? Now Scotty's on a max contract. You know, Emmanuel quickly is is flourishing. Maybe RJ Barrett's on this team. Maybe he's not. Maybe Grady Dick is on this team. Maybe he's like borderline all-star. Three years from now, you're going to look back at the season as a very, very uncomfortable but necessary step to get you where you needed to go. Peace. Have a great one. Appreciate y'all for coming through. Take care.